Hi here. Um, good afternoon, colleagues, dear participants, distinguished panelists, a warm welcome from Bangkok. This is Hamza Ali Malik. I'm the Director of Macroeconomic Policy and Financing and Development Division here at ASCAP. Um, welcome to this uh, national workshop on building forward better, securing inclusive, resilient, and sustainable development in Nepal. Um, this is part of our ongoing efforts in translating our research work that we shared with the member states of Asia and the Pacific through our flagship publication, Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific, back in April 2021. Um, the publication shared the findings of our macroeconometric model that we have developed, which pays attention, simultaneous attention to economic considerations, social consideration, and environmental consideration while devising forward-looking policy packages and assess quantitatively its implications. So our aim, our objective was very simple, to try and advise member states on the kind of policies they can and should consider, and more importantly, to understand the various implications of those policies, especially on the fiscal and debt positions of the country, as many of the policies require significant fiscal resources. And since then, we have been working with several countries in the region to try and engage and collaborate with uh, member states, uh, their national planning uh, officials, to try alter the basic assumptions of the model, to incorporate the scenarios or priorities of those countries in our framework, and then share our results uh, with, the, uh, with the member states. So hopefully through this very interactive process, we'll be able to build the capacity of member states to try and analyze the broad three dimensions of sustainable development, economic, social, and environment in a more integrated manner and assess quantitatively um, uh, the implications of if countries choose to go in that direction. So today I'm very heartened to have, we have been joined by, know that we have been joined by um, our executive secretary, Ms. Ibu Amida, Alice Jabana, Director Secretary of ASCAP, Dr. Pushpa Raman Vagle is the member of National Planning Commission, and Ms. Mr. Richard Howard, who's the acting United Nations resident coordinator in Nepal. So these, are, these, these three are going to be the distinguished speakers in the opening session. After the opening session in session two, uh, which will be moderated by my colleague Rajan Ratna, uh, we'll get delve a little bit more in the details of what exactly is the situation in Nepal and what are the basic findings of our model uh, coming out from uh, adjustment made for the Nepal's economy's case, which will be presented by our colleague, uh, ex-colleague and a good friend, Don Holland. So without further ado, let me invite Mr. Dr. Pushpa Raman Bagde to please set the scene and share his opening remarks. Dr. Wagley, the floor is yours, sir. For giving the opportunity, I'm here. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you for giving the opportunity, I'm here. Our Excellency, our Mida, Salsia, Alice Javana, Executive Secretary of ISCAP, Mr. Richard Howard, Acting United Nations Residence Coordinator in Nepal, distinguished delegates, experts, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege and honor to be here to extend a hand of cooperation to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific SCAP, the United Nations Resident Coordinator's Office, UNRCO in Nepal for organizing this virtual national workshop on building for our better, securing inclusive, resilient, and green development in Nepal. I wish everyone present here warm greetings. Nepal, a landlocked nation in one of the least developed countries in the world. It has been facing multiple risks and vulnerabilities, and particularly climate induced 
disasters, trade deficits, and other external shocks. On one hand, the country has repeatedly suffered from the devastating disasters such as the Gorkha earthquake in 2015, floods and landslides in 2017, and on seasonal heavy rain and flood in October 2021. On the other hand, similar to other countries, it is heavily impacted by COVID-19 pandemic since last two years. Due to these multiple incidents, we have lost thousands of lives and billions of dollars in economic damages and losses. Meanwhile, Nepal, a mountain country, continues to face several climate change challenges, which may further escalate in coming day. If we fail to properly design and implement adaptation and mitigation measures. This example highlights the urgency of building a resilient society and economy. In past five years, Nepal has made remarkable progress on reconstruction of the private and public housing, public infrastructure, and heritage that were heavily damaged by the 2015 earthquake. Furthermore, the past attempts to make the country more inclusive are reflected in increased participation of women, ethnic minorities, and marginalized population in several institutions of the state. Now, more than 40% of elected representatives are women. Literacy, enrollment, mortality, and parity in education and health sectors are not wildly. However, it's challenging to sustain these past achievements and enhance the supply and access to quality service in social, economic, and in structural fronts while making development greener, inclusive, just and resilient. Our long-term visions, the 15th plan, among others, has set long-term visions, goals, and targets on these matters. Accordingly, the policies, strategies, and programs have been directed towards these goals and visions. However, we need huge investment to re revive the economy from COVID-19, as well as finances to fill the resources gap in achieving the development targets and sustainable development goals. So I would like to request UN SCAP and UNDP and other development partners to further gear up cooperation for Nepal. Meanwhile, we also urge to continue financing climate change management programs. We would like to invite foreign investment in areas of national priority. The ORSA is an endeavor to make an evidence-based policy on macroeconomics to enhance skill for middle-based policy analysis and simulations. So I hope this ORSA will help the participants, the government officials, development partners, academia, and other stakeholders attending the event to understand available policy options on microeconomics. The 
presentations from NPC will highlight the current scenario and requirements for making robust policies. The ORSAF will develop in country capacity to build a resilient, socially inclusive, and ecologically sustainable Nepal. I humbly request the participants for active participation in acquiring the knowledge and skills the ORSAF has to offer. Finally, I thank UNSCAP and UNRCO for organizing this workshop in coming days. I hope and wish we are able to organize these types of workshop and training physically for more lively and interactive discussions. I personally and on behalf of the National Planning Commission Nepal, wish for fruitful discussion and the successful completion of this workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wagley, for sharing this bird's eye view of the Nepal's situation and your comments, yeah, commitment yeah. to forge ahead um, uh, with uh, ensuring inclusive, uh, resilient, and sustainable development in your country. Let me now turn to our executive secretary, Ms. Armida Ali Jabana. Uh, Armida, the floor is yours, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings. Very good afternoon to all colleagues, distinguished participants, uh, Excellency Dr. Puspa Raman uh, Wagle, member of the National Planning Commission of Nepal, my colleague Richard Howard, acting UNRC in Nepal, <clears throat> distinguished participants and uh, colleagues and friends. It is indeed my great pleasure to warmly welcome all of you to this workshop on policies to build forward better together in Nepal. And this is a joint collaboration uh, between the National Planning Commission of Nepal, ESCAP, as well as the UN country team uh, through the RCO. Uh, distinguished uh, participants, as uh, you know, we are now entering the third year already of this COVID-19 pandemic, still ongoing in many parts of the world. Uh, but some in some countries already receding, some is still uh, has this surge, yeah? and, and we are not quite sure when uh, this crisis will end. But hopefully, yes, some positive signs uh, we already see, uh, hopefully by this coming months uh, this year, at the very least, yeah, we've seen a significant improvement on that front. But again, of course, yeah, because of this pandemic has been prolonged more than two years now, the socioeconomic impact has been uh, tremendous uh, in all fronts, yeah, for many countries. Uh, in the past two years, especially the first, uh, uh, the first two years, we have seen that governments have concentrated their efforts very much on how to mitigate the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19, protect the population, especially by uh, covering it, by accelerating the delivery of the three components to tackle this crisis pandemic, which is the vaccine, draw out of vaccine vaccination, diagnostic, as well as the therapeutics. But within that context also we've seen, yeah, that uh, the efforts how to scale up social protection, to scale up the coverage of the healthcare, including uh, the emphasis and focus on the primary healthcare uh, service delivery have been in many place, places also been strengthened. But at the same time, we've also seen, again, this very concerning trend. Yeah, again, uh, I think a few days ago, IPCC released another report showing on the climate change front, we are definitely not on the right track, even we are on the wrong track, yeah? in which uh, the CO2 emission is still increasing with uh, this huge impact, uh, the impact on climate change yeah? on again on many fronts, which uh, in 
our uh, region here, yeah, in our region, again, uh, Mr. Wagley mentioned in the case of Nepal, right, uh, was uh, impacted by the severe uh, natural disaster a few years ago. Uh, again, it's not only Nepal, which, uh, which is a vulnerable country in this case, but many countries in our region also very vulnerable to natural disaster. So again, this three, if I may say, three uh, triple uh, sort of crisis, yeah, uh, which in many instances also interlinked or exacerbated, exacerbating one another is another challenges yeah, that countries in regions need uh, to uh, take into account. And recently, uh, even if all these challenges is not enough, yeah, recently in the past few days and still ongoing very concerning development uh, event uh, uh, taking sh taking a shape evolving, yeah, especially in Europe yeah, with the war in, in Europe, in Ukraine, Russia, but with the impact, huge impact. Yeah. We've seen, uh, I don't know the number now today, yeah, but uh, for example, yesterday, oil price have reached uh, 130, 140 dollar per barrel, which is really a record high uh, in, the, in the past uh, recent memory. Uh, not to mention, uh, of course, the impact on many, many prices, commodities, minerals, and so on. Uh, <laughs> the flow of uh, uh, what the goods, yeah, including travel, now have been severely impacted. So I think this is the fourth dimension. Yeah, that uh, recently we also need to take into account and yeah, how to mitigate this yeah, sort of uh, navigate yeah, all these challenges. And, and aside from that, again, in several countries in our region or elsewhere, we've seen uh, this, uh, the, the increasing trend yeah, of conflict, yeah, which means that's not only socioeconomic, maybe the root, the root is socioeconomic, but this political dimension is also there. Yeah, of course, this is a little bit beyond, but if we, if we are, uh, you know, in the de development, in the planning sphere, this is certainly one element that we need to take into account. So uh, again, yeah, uh, going forward, yes. Yeah, so I think with this third year and going forward, many countries also in the region started to, uh, to go into the recovery path, recovery mode, not, not only, uh, in the mitigation mode or path yet, yeah, starting in the recovery path. Uh, so therefore, with all this background, yeah, but at the same time, uh, I don't mean to be that pessimistic, yeah, uh, you know, in all fronts, but I'm sure in any countries, there are always yeah, this uh, great potentials untapped or already there, yeah, in which uh, each country can uh, further harness, yeah. So then, the question is going forward, recovery and beyond. It's not only recovery, recovery and beyond, medium to longer term, as we are also doing this uh, simulation planning exercise here. Yeah? We need to go beyond short term, medium to longer term view. What is the vision? But what is the vision? Taking into account all this uh, background that I mentioned earlier. So therefore, I think three points. Yeah? needs uh, to be uh, really uh, to be uh, taken into account yeah, in any planning scenario. First is the resiliency, resiliency to future shocks, to future pandemics, including and how to, uh, for any countries, yeah, to be better prepared. Yet any shock, uh, whether economic or non-economic, now increasingly the non-economic, but with economic and social, and as well as environmental, implication. Second is inclusiveness. Again, we've seen yeah, that the, the pandemic especially has exacerbated uh, this inequality, including uh, the segment of society that are most vulnerable. Yes, so that therefore the leave no one behind, yeah, that needs to be center stage. Third is on the sustainability aspect. Uh, again, not only uh, to tackle climate change, climate action, but how to develop, recover, develop longer term in a more sustainable manner. So many, many uh, concepts is, is there already. The green recovery, green economy, green blue, 
recovery, green blue economy, yeah, in blue, uh, especially yeah, for countries that are endowed yeah, with uh, this, uh, you know, uh, marine resources, ocean related resources. Yeah. Uh, and two more elements uh, that we've seen also playing a significant uh, role and part and, and how also uh, to leverage these two elements further. One is digital or digitalization. We've seen that it has been one of the transforming uh, factor yeah, or key transformer uh, in this pandemic, including in the recovery. How uh, with this digitalization, how to widen the digital process, how to accelerate digitalization at the same time also benefit yeah, from the digitalization to transform the not only the economy, but also the society. And the second one is of course finance, financing. Again, uh, due to this prolonged pandemic crisis, uh, so therefore many countries face with a huge debt yeah, issue problem. So therefore in order to recover, in order uh, to go back on the right track yeah, to a sustainable long-term recovery, then we need to also uh, you know, have this financing strategy in place here. Yeah? not only to tackle the debt, increasing the burden, but also to develop the more innovative financing instrument yeah, that are available or the potentials yeah, that can be tapped on. So with this, again, I would like to thank, especially the government of Nepal, the planning commission for the opportunity to collaborate and uh, to work together and looking forward also uh, to enhance the, the already excellent collaboration further. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ibu Amida, for um, drawing our attention to additional challenges uh, that most countries in the region are facing, such as in addition to natural disasters and other economic shocks, uh, ongoing climate crisis, I would say, and the recent uh, Ukraine-Russian conflict that is spilling over to commodity prices that's going to have a severely negative impact on several economies, developing countries in our region. And also laying out a sort of contours of what factors needs to be considered as economies go forward in envisaging a policy uh, scenario. You had two examples of digitalization and financing in that way. Someone said uh, in the context of 2007-2008 crisis, never let a good crisis go to waste because it comes, becomes to be an opportunity to rethink several of the ongoing policies, processes, and approaches that are being developed. And I think in this context, there's a lot more conversation happening on ensuring that the economy is not only recovered in a traditional sense of having rapid and sustained GDP growth, but also uh, they pay attention to social and environment considerations as well. Um, so thank you very much for that. Let me now turn to our last speaker for this opening session, uh, Mr. Richard Howard, who's the acting United Nations resident coordinator in Nepal. Richard, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Pushpa Raman Wagle from the NPC. Thank you very much. Ms. Armida Salicia Ali Shabana, Executive Secretary of ESCAP, and colleagues from the government of Nepal, development partners, A workshop on building forward better, securing inclusive, resilient, and green development in Nepal. And let me first by thanking all the colleagues involved from the Nepal government and ESCAP for helping us to organize this important workshop. And we're rapidly, rapidly approaching the 2030 horizon for the sustainable development goals. It is clear that we are not making adequate progress and the pandemic has set us back even further. We know this is certainly the case in Nepal, and we need a better understanding of how well we are doing with respect to reaching goals and how progress may have been hindered by the pandemic and how and what we should do with the government of Nepal and civil society to accelerate, accelerate progress as we move forward to 2030 and beyond. In the context, I believe the value of having a macroeconomic model that captures interactions between the economic, social, environmental variables is absolutely essential. We must ensure fiscal spending supports Nepal in building back better and stronger, taking a path that allows Nepal 
Nepal's economy and society to be more resilient to shocks, ecological sustainability, and inclusive of those who have been left behind in the past. And UNSCAP in building, in, in, sorry, UNSCAP in partnership with the MPC are working further in integrating sustainable development into microeconomic modeling in Nepal with this workshop, and we can inform the work that we are doing through this way. Here, the objective will be to discuss ideas on public policy options to help Nepal build, for, build forward better and ensure that macroeconomic analysis also integrates social and environmental analyses. For Nepal, in addition to its national development goal set in the 15th plan, there are three important milestones ahead. COVID recovery, smooth LDC transition in 2026, and achieving the 2030 agenda. And we at the UN are committed fully to work with the government on all three areas. In fact, the UN country team in collaboration with the government of Nepal is now embarking on the development of our next UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework, which will frame our partnership for the next five years. It will guide us as we work with the three tiers of government and accelerating progress on the SDGs and, our, and, our, and solidify our support to the government in the LDC graduation process. The macroeconomic modeling will be essential for us in the formulation of the CF, and particularly in relation to supporting a process that allows for a shock resistant and sustainable LDC graduation. As the UN, we commit our support to ensuring a trajectory that promotes green, resilient, and inclusive growth that leaves no one behind. Thank you very much, and I wish you a most successful workshop in the two days ahead. Thank you. Back to you, Hamza. Thank you, Richard, for a succinct to the point and sharp intervention and outing remarks, um, drawing attention to, again, the need to have macroeconomic policy making integrate social environment consideration. I think that's a obvious theme that we are reiterating, but there's no harm in repeating that and building a narrative around these things. Um, so with this, I think we come to the end of the opening session. Let me again, once again, thank you very much, the National Planning Commission, uh, member Dr. Wagle, uh, Ibu Amida, our Executive Secretary, and Richard Howard uh, for supporting our workshop and for joining us today in the opening session. Uh, I now hand over to my colleague, Rajan Ratna, who will be leading session two talking about building Nepal forward better, one of the policy options and some of the implications. I wish you a very successful workshop. Rajan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Hamza. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and uh, I must also join my colleagues, uh, uh, Hamza and uh, our Executive Secretary, uh, Ibu Armida, in complementing uh, the government of Nepal for this very timely uh, workshop. Uh, now, in this session, uh, we are going to discuss about uh, uh, building Nepal forward better and what are the policy options and implications. And uh, this uh, session will look into uh, Nepal's major development opportunities and the challenges uh, and then we discuss about the various socio-economic and environmental implications uh, of uh, selecting to achieve more inclusive, resilient, and green development. Uh, for this session, uh, we have uh, two presenters uh, who will make the presentation and then we'll go for the, uh, the question answer session. Uh, each presenter will have uh, around 20 minutes time. Uh, so the first presentation comes from Dr. Chakrapani Acharya. He's a program director in the National Planning Commission of Nepal. Uh, and the topic uh, on which he will make the presentation is Pathways to Sustainable Development in Nepal. Uh, Dr. Acharya, uh, you can uh, switch your video on if you're there. and. Uh, also, you can share your screen for the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, thank you, Dadan. Uh, uh, 
Honorable, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. see your presentation. Okay, 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 thank you. Uh, Honorable Vice Chair, uh, sorry, Honorable Member of National Planning Commission, uh, Our Excellency uh, uh, Mr. Arnida, uh, Mr. Richard uh, Holland, Acting uh, United Nations uh, Resident Coordinator in Nepal, uh, uh, Joint Secretary of National Planning Commission, um, distinguished uh, delegates, uh, uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to to, to have a presentation about uh, pathways to sustainable development in Nepal. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, I'll cover uh, these uh, topics uh, within this uh, presentation. Uh, uh, basically, the our pathways towards sustainable development, our uh, plan, vision, plans, and uh, uh, commitment. Uh, and the progress towards uh, sustainable development goals, uh, uh, our framework for cl climate change management and disaster re reduction and management and the uh, way forward. Uh, uh, as we mentioned that uh, Nepal is a uh, uh, very diverse country uh, in terms of the social diversity, cultural diversity, as well as geographical and natural diversity. Uh, meanwhile, it has, uh, it, it has uh, created uh, challenges to um, challenge it in, the, in another front. And it, it has uh, multiple uh, vulnerabilities uh, on the uh, natural disaster, basically the um, uh, climate induced uh, disaster. And uh, uh, we have also faced other uh, uh, challenges like the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, we faced uh, last uh, 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 seven year dark earthquake and floods and landslides and other things. And uh, meanwhile, we have uh, now uh, marched towards the graduation from LDC uh, to be effective by uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2026. And we, we are uh, uh, regarding our uh, regarding to these uh, issues and challenges, we, our constitution uh, has several provisions on sustainable development. Uh, sustainable development, uh, uh, including its preamble, uh, fundamental rights such as clean environment, education, health, uh, social services, rights of women, uh, children, senior citizens, Dalits. Uh, as well as social security, social inclusion, um, among others. And it, it is directly related to inclusive and sustainable uh, development of Nepal. Uh, meanwhile, the directive principles, policies, and rights of federal, provincial, and local governments uh, are also um, focused uh, on the sustainable development of the country. Uh, there are several acts, rules uh, to implement uh, these provisions. Uh, and also there are uh, mm, 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 constitutional institutions uh, and other uh, oversight and implementing uh, government institutions that are functional uh, in this uh, direction. Uh, the state has uh, international commitment, implementation and mainstreaming in national and development policies and plan, plans, and, uh, including the sustainable development goals. Our long-term vision for 20, uh, 2043, uh, periodic plans uh, in, uh, such as the 14 plan and 15 plan, uh, uh, our recently developing the draft uh, transition, uh, transition strategy uh, have focused uh, in this direction. And uh, there are also national and sectoral policies and strategies uh, uh, for these uh, issues. Uh, meanwhile, uh, province and local level have also developed their periodic plans, uh, programs, and budgets uh, aligning these uh, uh, sustainable development issues. Uh, and, and finally, the, uh, the different uh, campaigns on social, economic, and uh, environmental fronts. Uh, the programs and projects uh, are also uh, design, have been designed and implemented. Uh, 
Uh, let me uh, present some highlights uh, about the major achievements regarding the um, our sustainable development, uh, uh, its inclusivity and uh, resilient uh, society. Uh, for example, uh, the area under forest cover coverage has been uh, um, heavily increased uh, in recent years and it's reached about 45%. Uh, it includes both the protected areas and the successes in community forest uh, management. And electricity generation has also increased uh, massively in recent years and has reached about uh, 2,100 megawatt. Uh, there are also um, achievements in uh, alternative energies like improved cooking stoves, uh, uh, solar electrification systems, institutional uh, solar systems, micro hydroelectricity, uh, biogas plants as well. And uh, uh, recently, the access to power electricity has reached to 92 percent uh, of the population. Uh, uh, our uh, our uh, uh, efforts on uh, social front has also um, impressive. Uh, basically, uh, in in past years, uh, we have. Uh, reduced poverty, both the multidimensional poverty and headcount poverty uh, significantly, uh, but it has uh, uh, hampered due to COVID-19. And this data is before prior to the COVID-19, but uh, uh, still we have a challenge to attain these uh, achievements. Uh, we have success in literacy rate, uh, basic level enrollment, uh, child mortality rate, uh, as well. And uh, our coverage um, by the social security schemes uh, and plans has reached to 32% of population. Uh, uh, in, and uh, our budget for social security uh, is about 13%. Uh, there is impressive uh, participation of women in both uh, the political uh, front as well as the um, uh, civil service at the private, private sector front. Uh, and uh, as our Honorable uh, member uh, said that we have uh, we have achieved uh, more than uh, forty percent uh, uh, on average uh, at the federal, provincial, and local level. I mean, while uh, the public service and the private sector uh, participations, once participation is also impressive. Uh, let me. Uh, introduce uh, some highlights about uh, recent uh, reconstruction uh, 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 initiatives uh, uh, in the, during the last uh, five years. Uh, we have now I'm going Doctor Acharya, do you want me to run your PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, yes, we have the power out uh, while making presentation. So, uh, I'm, 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 just a moment. I would like to uh, present from my laptop. Okay. Okay, okay sorry. Hmm. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see. You can go to the next slide. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Okay, is it okay? Uh, you you uh, have another 10 minutes to finish your presentation. Okay, okay, no worries. Okay. Uh, these are the achievements on uh, reconstruction, and we have uh, constructed more than 600,000 
private dwellings and uh, the 138,000 are under construction. We have also the constructed about seven, 6,700 district buildings, uh, 762 uh, health institutions, and uh, uh, the, there is the uh, progress on archaeological uh, deconstruction of, of archaeological heritage. And we have the long term vision of First Person Nepal, Happy Nepali. It, uh, it, uh, it has mentioned uh, about the it has mentioned uh, prosperous, independent, and uh, socialism oriented. Uh, uh, independent and socialism oriented economy. Uh, economy with a happy and uh, happy, healthy, educated citizens enjoying, enjoying equality of opportunity, dignity, and high standard of living. And it has mentioned uh, the 10 uh, national goals, and the four goals are related to prosperous Nepal, and the uh, six are related to happy okay. Nepali. And basically, uh, this is focus on uh, uh, sustainable development, inclusiveness, uh, and uh, a resilient society. And, uh, we have set 10 uh, drivers of uh, transformation, and uh, these are uh, about uh, transport, information, and communication human research and entrepreneur uh, work culture, hydroelectricity production and green economy, production, productivity and competitiveness, uh, and uh, mm, related to provincial and local economy, uh, social protection and social security, governance reform and uh, good governance. Uh, enables are about uh, for the political commitment, civic awareness, our uh, diversity, uh, social capital and diaspora, uh, clean and renewable energy, our um, fiscal uh, federalism and uh, federal governance and the goodwill of uh, the friendly nations and uh, international community. Uh, accordingly, our uh, 15 plan has set the uh, national uh, eight national targets, and I, I like to highlight, highlight two targets here. First is achieve high rapid, sustainable, and employment-oriented growth. Another is to build a just society characterized by socio-economically sorry uh, equality absence and poverty, as well as uh, improve uh, resilience of the society. Mm, the plan uh, has uh, uh, orientation towards sustainable development. Um, for example, macroeconomic policies focus on sustainable consumption, saving, uh, and investment promotion. Economic policies uh, focus on pro enhancing production and productivity. Uh, social pro pro policies uh, uh, direct towards the uh, improving social infrastructure, uh, quality and equity of social services. Mm. Uh, infrastructure po policies uh, focus on co coverage, quality, uh, enhancement, clean and integrated system. Uh, there are also the cross-cutting issues like environment and climate change, and disaster risk, uh, reduction and management. Uh, these are the long-term targets about uh, the uh, sustainable development. Uh, let me highlight about uh, uh, like the inequality, uh, in, uh, reducing inequality, enhancing life expectancy, literacy rate, uh, gender equality, uh, as well as the electricity generation, uh, uh, and the, uh, enhancing the increase in the consumption of renewable energy from 7% uh, uh, from the base year to 50% uh, by the end of 2043. And uh, reducing uh, the uh, affected households from the disaster to by uh, nearly one third. There are also the efforts uh, to, to implement uh, the strategies in Nepal. Uh, we had uh, the strategy uh, uh, status and roadmaps in 2017. We did uh, two BNR in 2017 and 2020. Uh, our my priority plans are, are uh, managed, have uh, internalized uh, and many the uh, strategies uh, and our budget systems and planning, uh, sorry, budget system and programs are also uh, aligned in this direction. Uh, we have National Cl uh, Climate Change Policy 2019. It, it has uh, uh, several objectives to enhance uh, the adaptation capacity of Nepal, uh, building resilience, and promote green, green economy. 
uh, it, it focuses on financial resources mobilization, uh, mainstreaming uh, climate change issues uh, in development process. And it has set eight uh, areas of policy intervention, including uh, from agriculture and food security uh, to disaster risk management, uh, reduction, reduction and management. Uh, it has also highlighted cross-cutting issues uh, like climate finance management, JC, awareness raising and capacity development, research technology and uh, technology development and expansion. And uh, there is another uh, policy on uh, disaster uh, risk reduction, 2018. It, uh, it focuses on enhancing uh, the information uh, about disaster risks and its understanding, extending disaster risk governance, mainstreaming it in the development process, and enhancing the disaster risk resilience. And we have also the disaster risk reduction management, uh, reduction and management in 2017. It focuses on institutional arrangements. Uh, and uh, implementing the policy. Now uh, I'm at the, at the end, uh, uh, highlighting these uh, major achievements and issues. Uh, we we have now we need to focus on um, revival of the livelihood, economy, and our achievements in social fronts that were heavily affected by the COVID-19 pandemic in uh, during last two years. Another is achieving our high sustainable and employment oriented uh, economic growth uh, for a um, couple of decades uh, ahead, uh, financing resources gap for achieving, achieving these goals and targets, uh, including sustainable development goals, designing appropriate policies and programs uh, to, uh, to our sustainable development. Uh, and also the uh, we have to develop our uh, physical infrastructure that are more uh, disaster risk uh, resilient and we need to um, invest uh, more on hydroelectricity and uh, reduce the consumption of fossil fuels uh, and contribute to um, uh, green uh, uh, economy, green growth. And finally, uh, we have to sustain our achievements in social sector and social protection. Uh, let me end uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you for your uh, kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Acharya, for your very elaborate and detailed uh, uh, presentation. Uh, maybe you can stop uh, sharing your... Yes, okay. So, uh, thank you. I know you need to stop uh, sharing your screen. Okay. Okay. Ah, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it was good to listen to, uh, you know, the presentation which highlighted many challenges in Nepal, including climate change related disaster risk reduction, uh, and also the challenges emanating from the LDC graduation. At the same time, the impact of COVID, and then uh, you highlighted on the various legal provisions and constitutional provisions relating to the SDGs, and then highlighted the achievements and the status or the progress. Uh, it was nice to know about uh, the drivers of transformation, and also uh, to know that the 15 plan also has incorporated uh, many strategies and policy, including the long-term targets on the SDGs. And it was heartening to see that while the targets for SDGs are 2030, um, the planning is, uh, or the long-term target have been looked by Nepal, even going beyond up to 2043-44. And that uh, brings again, uh, another important uh, dimension uh, of uh, that of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the challenges which uh, Nepal is going to face, which you have highlighted in your uh, way forward presentation, how to uh, have a, a sustainable uh, economic, social and environmental resilience and, and recovery process coming out of COVID. And for that, uh, it's not only the LDC graduation or economic growth, 
but also highlighting the uh, financing uh, for the gaps uh, and that is a big challenge especially in uh, during the covid and post covid for many of the countries in asia pacific as well as in south asia because the governments have come with diversion of uh, their finances in mitigating the impact of covid and uh, the investment you know, stimulus packages, etc., have been announced by the government. So uh, it is very important uh, to have these kind of dimensions, and and that is why I think the second uh, presentation, which will be made by Miss Dawn Holland, she is a senior consultant on macroeconomic modeling, who has been engaged by us, uh, and she will be presenting on the socio-economic uh, and environmental of the policy uh, scenarios in the past. So basically these two presentations uh, is very a gap. Uh, Don will give you some uh, policy prescriptions as to how and what could be done. So Don, uh, welcome and you have the floor please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to have the opportunity to join you uh, all this morning. Uh, this morning for me, sorry, this afternoon <laughs> for everyone else. Um, I, um, uh, it's been a real pleasure to have the um, opportunity to uh, work with uh, jointly this joint project um, between SCAP and the UN country team for Nepal and the National Planning Commission. Um, to develop a set of policy scenarios to explore some of the options. We can only, we'll only be able to cover um, a very uh, narrow subset of the um, many policies that were highlighted by uh, Dr. Uh, Acharya. Um, uh, um, but let me um, uh, take, you, take you through some of the, the work that we, we have been doing as part of this, this project. Um, so, but first, I would also like to say a special thank you to veteran Sir Manitham from ESCAP, who has really helped to push uh, this uh, project, uh, joint um, uh, project forward. Um, so the scenarios um, that I'll um, be sharing with you are applications of the ESCAP macroeconomic model, which, as Hamza said in his uh, introductory remarks, um, was developed by the Macroeconomic Policy and Analysis Section at uh, UNSCAP to support the design of economic recovery packages for countries in the Asia and Pacific region. And for this project, we've uh, tailored um, the model uh, for the economy of Nepal to capture some of the country specific features. And that includes um, in specifically developing a model of tourism that captures the interactions between investment in tourism infrastructure, tourism export revenue, and also the environmental pressures um, that are caused by a, a, a rise in tourist arrivals. The ESCAP, um, just a few brief words on what type of model we're actually working with. So the ESCAP macroeconomic model for Nepal, um, it's part of a global model. So it includes 60 individual country and regional models, including obviously a model of Nepal, which are all linked together in a global framework. And it's based on a standard macroeconomic framework to which we've introduced um, important channels to capture key social and environmental variables. So we describe it in sort of technical terms as a, as a structural econometric model. Um, it, it captures country specific um, uh, dynamic behaviors, um, but it's based on a uh, fairly um, uh, a uh, rigid um, uh, theoretical foundation. And so it finds a sort of halfway house between theory-based modeling and data-based modeling. Um, it's been designed primarily for scenario studies rather than for forecasting. So that is what we've been applying it to here. And it can be applied to a wide range of policy questions. And we'll only review a few of them here. And it's also been used 
for stress testing and debt sustainability analysis. So in terms of its basic structure, we distinguish, distinguish between the behavior of households, farms, and the government sectors. So for example, we have households that consume, they save, and they supply labor. Um, we have farms that employ labor, they produce output, and they invest. And then we have the government sector that raises revenue through taxation, um, provides uh, um, goods and services um, through spending that revenue, and conducts monetary policy through interest rate and exchange rate adjustments. Um, so to this sort of standard macroeconomic framework, we've introduced um, uh, models uh, that capture poverty, which depend on income and after-tax measures of inequality. Um, we've also included measures, um, a, a, a model of emissions and air pollution, which depend on the level of economic activity, the energy efficiency of production, the energy mix, so that depends on how much fossil fuels are being used compared to um, how much uh, renewable energy is being used. And also for the model for Nepal, we've um, included the uh, tourist arrivals in this model. Um, the global, in the global model, the countries um, and regions are linked together through trade, through remittances, through financial markets, as well as through global carbon emissions and energy markets. So as I said, the model is designed primarily for scenarios rather than forecasting. What do we mean by this? So a, a policy scenario is developed relative to a baseline set of assumptions. So what we're trying to do is isolate the impact of one specific policy change. And we assess that impact relative to the baseline. So it, it, we, we could look at, for example, um, a new government spending program, uh, the um, a sudden unexpected rise in the oil price, um, as was highlighted earlier, a drop in world trade, etc. And we would normally view the output from the scenario in terms of how they impact the baseline. So in terms of their percentage um, or absolute difference from the baseline values. So that's how um, the figures that um, I'll show should be, should be interpreted. And what that also means um, when we um, uh, look more deeply at how to use the model is that it's much easier to maintain than uh, many forecasting models um, because the results are largely invariant to small changes in that forecast baseline. So, um, uh, obviously, there are a number of uh, development challenges um, in Nepal, a, a wide range of policies um, that are underway, um, as was uh, um, um, uh, demonstrated in, in the previous presentation. Um, but here we've only met, um, been able to address a few, a few of those of those areas. So the scenarios that we've included in the um, in the report that's um, gone alongside this project focus on three areas. So first, uh, broadening export capacities, and in particular, we look at um, green and sustainable tourism, and also at tapping into demand for um, uh, higher value added goods exports, for example, in the agricultural and apparel sectors. Uh, we look at investing in productive capacity. So that's investments in areas such as ICT infrastructure, uh, research and development, education, all of which deliver high long-term returns um, to, the, to the economy. And we look at the impacts of the planned expansion of energy supply, and in particular, at broadening um, electrification within the economy so that there's a higher reliance on the clean electricity that um, Nepal can uh, provide. So first, let's have a look. Um, we won't have 
a chance to go through the model in more detail, but I thought it would be um, interesting to um, show you how we've um, modeled um, the uh, tourist arrivals within, within um, uh, Nepal. And I think this is a really good example of why it's so important to have a model that looks at both the economic, social, and environmental impacts of any policy initiative, because we can see here that we've got some uh, important tensions um, in those areas. So we have tourist arrivals um, which deliver important um, economic returns. So they raise um, export revenue, um, which raises GDP, which brings in higher tax revenue um, and supports um, economic growth. Um, also important social returns. Um, tourism is labor intensive. It um, creates uh, additional jobs, which raise revenue, um, which reduces um, uh, inequality and poverty. So those are the positives, but then we also have the negative impacts that it can cause on the environmental side, um, increasing CO2 emissions and pollution. And these have long-term negative consequences for the economy as well, um, impacting labor productivity and potential output um, negatively over the long term. So having a model that can um, assess the relative impacts of these conflicting forces is extremely um, useful. So um, let's I'll just take you through some of the sort of key takeaways um, that we have um, uh, um, found in running these scenarios. So one of the takeaways is that a rise in tourism in Nepal without concerted efforts to simultaneously develop green and sustainable tourism would um, be expected to have um, essentially negligible impacts um, uh, on the economy in the long term um, because the, uh, the the environmental costs, so significant rise in CO2 emissions and pollution would offset the returns that you um, would ordinarily expect. So little um, uh, economic gains, um, but high environmental cost. So we then develop a scenario that um, looks at, um, uh, includes investment in green and sustainable tourism. And we've um, uh, identified several areas of investment um, um, that could help to deliver um, uh, a, a, gr a, green, a greener and more sustainable tourist sector. Um, for example, investment in water and sanitation, in biodiversity, climate resilience, in broadening access to electricity and electrification, um, in, and investment and transport um, infrastructure investment. Now, the estimates suggest that investing just over 6% of GDP per annum over the next 10 years um, in these areas would allow tourist arrivals to, to rise by about 100,000 persons per annum, so up um, by a, a total of 1 million over 10 years without increasing CO2 emissions. But of course, 6% uh, of GDP is a very um, uh, enormous uh, amount of investment. Now, if this is financed entirely through government borrowing, our model also captures the sort of debt strains that might arise in such a scenario. So when you increase um, government borrowing, that can cause the risk premium on, uh, on borrowing to rise, making it more costly to borrow, making it more costly to service the debt, which in turn can cause the um, a, a sort of spiral, a debt spiral to um, emerge, which squeezes out investment, pushes up inflation, and uh, and puts pressure on uh, on foreign exchange. Um, so. Um, uh, clearly, it's essential to consider how um, a, a, an ambitious um, investment program of this type um, can be sustainably financed. 
And while there are a number of different ways um, that could finance such a program, um, we develop a scenario that generates sufficient revenues by broadening the tax base, um, in, involving an increase in both income tax and corporate tax rates. Now, under this scenario, this would allow GDP to rise, um, allow the government debt to GDP ratio to remain stable, um, and reduce poverty, reduce pollution, and also um, have a small negative net impact on CO2 emissions over the longer term. So we can um, have developed a, um, a scenario that is financed through Nepal's own resources um, that um, live, delivers both um, um, strong economic returns, strong social returns, and um, does not damage the environment uh, further. Um, now, there are several different scenarios that we explore in the, um, uh, in the, in, in the report. Um, I'll just focus on our final combined scenario where we um, um, merge the uh, investment in, um, uh, in green and sustainable tourism with uh, several other areas, including um, investment um, to, uh, um, uh, to, to broaden uh, productive capacities. So investing in ICT, in education and R&D, investment to um, expand export um, opportunities um, uh, by investing in the quality, um, export quality skills and equipment, and, um, and um, merge these together with a, a decline in uh, trade barriers through a reduction in trade costs and an increase in the electricity share of energy consumption. Um, and the full program is financed by broadening the tax base. Now, as I said before, there's, um, there are many other um, financing options uh, that are available um, uh, through, for example, foreign direct investment, public-private partnerships, uh, official, official um, uh, development assistance or international development agencies, um, efficiency gains. Um, all, there are um, a, a wide number of financing options, but we wanted to demonstrate that an ambitious program of this magnitude can actually be sustainably financed um, uh, through um, uh, Nepal's own resources. So I'll just take you through the final key sort of takeaways uh, from this, uh, the scenarios that we developed as part um, of this report. And so, um, so, so first, first of all, um, the investment programs that we've outlined here um, would involve significant initial outlays, but would raise the level of GDP by about 25% um, by 2050 relative to the baseline scenario that excludes these investment programs. So that's equivalent to a rise in the growth rate of about three quarters of a percentage point um, in each year over the coming 30 years. Um, and that increase is driven by productivity enhancing investments in education, uh, in infrastructure and in um, R&D, as well as an expansion of international trade and a decline in inequality, as well as health benefits from less pollution, all of which deliver positive um, impacts on productivity over, um, over the longer term. We would see poverty rates decline uh, significantly, supported by both the rise in economic activity and a reduction um, in inequality, driven um, largely by investments in education and also um, an expansion of the tourist uh, sector. Um, the risks uh, from climate related shocks would be expected to decline and CO2 emissions would be about 20% lower than in the absence of these policy measures. 
And finally, um, as I um, uh, mentioned, that Nepal has the capacity to deliver an ambitious investment program through its own resources, for example, by broadening the tax base, although there are also other financing op um, uh, options available. Um, but an important message that we really want to deliver, um, which I think is why having this model um, that looks at both the uh, simultaneously looks at economy, social and, and um, environmental returns, um, that a rapid rise in tourism without coordinated investment in green and sustainable tourism would put undue pressure on the environment and available resources and ultimately would deliver less in the way of economic returns. Um, investment in transport infrastructure can uh, um, both support a rise in tourism and also facilitate a rise in goods export, so has um, potential to deliver high returns. And investment that stimulates economic activity, um, we also need to warn again, um, is, is likely to increase greenhouse gas emissions unless it's also accompanied by appropriate environmental policies, such as a rise in the um, electrification and the electricity share of uh, energy consumption. So those are some of the key takeaways that we can illustrate by applying the um, ESCAP macroeconomic model for Nepal that we've developed um, for, uh, for this project. So I would like to thank you there um, and I will uh, stop now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent and a very detailed uh, presentation. Uh, Don, uh, it fully uh, takes into account uh, those concerns uh, which were presented uh, by Dr. Acharya as to the roadmap which we laid down. Uh, you have highlighted various scenarios as to what will happen uh, looking into the export capacity, productive capacity, and energy supply increase, and how. Uh, 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 in the best looking forward energy mix can, can have and, and look into and also how the tourists arrival will impact the economy of course dealing with the negatives and positives of both and that is where the modeling becomes important because you can estimate it and play and, and, and try to uh, you know focus with the policy interventions which take uh, more towards the positive impact and mitigate the negative so it's it's very uh, to look into as to how uh, you know the reduction in the trade cost and what kind of contribution to the GDP increase will happen and definitely productivity is already uh, identified earlier by the government of Nepal uh, they want to increase and they have a long term planning for that of course social sector and poverty rate will also decline and then. Uh, even the government of Nepal has recognized the climate related problems, challenges, and the disaster risk reduction. So I think uh, I must compliment you that you have perhaps anticipated what uh, you know, Dr. Acharya will be presenting, and then you have uh, tried to uh, to incorporate most of uh, those issues in the presentation through the modeling exercise. Uh, so thank you very much. And now uh, we have a time for question and answer session. Uh, there are two ways. Uh, either you can raise your hand, those who want to ask questions, uh, or you can uh, uh, type in the chat box and I will call you to, to uh, raise the question or adopt or if you have a comment. So anybody has uh, <clears throat> any comment or any uh, question on or some clarification from uh, Dr. Acharya on what he presented in Nepal. <clears throat> Please uh, feel free to ask questions.
So it, it seems uh, uh, the presentations are crystal clear to, to everybody who have been participating. Uh, and you do recognize. Uh, well, also, my colleague uh, Watt has said that these presentations will be posted on SCAP website so you can have an access to. Still, if somebody wants to have some question on the methodology used in the modeling, feel free, or some doubt on, on the roadmap for. Uh, Okay, let me let me uh, facilitate by asking uh, uh, Dr. Acharya. In it's very, as I found when you uh, made a presentation and uh, you highlighted about the long term targets, and those targets went beyond even 2043 uh, uh, for the period of 2043-44. Uh, I do recognize. Uh, uh, you have a 15th plan which is coming up. So what went into the government thinking to think that you need to go even beyond 2030 uh, and go 10 years or 15 years down the line? Dr. Acharya? Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Rajan. Uh, Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, duplication in the mic system. So no, no problem. You you can you can take your time on, on speaking. Uh, Uh, actually, uh, while uh, developing the long-term vision, uh, the, this is the concept paper of uh, long-term vision that is incorporated, incorporated in the uh, one of the chapter of the 15th plan is for 25 years. And uh, it's uh, basically, as you mentioned, it's behind uh, 2030. And, uh, and uh, 2030 is in the middle of this 25-year period. And... Uh, and uh, Regarding the this 25 years period, it has three uh, developed three stages. The stage one is uh, creating the foundation of sustainable, sorry, foundation of prosperity and happiness. Uh, that is, uh, we 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 are uh, going to uh, uh, make a last milestone in in, uh, in the 15th plan. And the 16th plan and 17th plan, that is 10 year period, and that goes beyond 2030. They are for accelerating these uh, uh, efforts uh, and uh, meanwhile achieving the targets of SDGs and going to, meet, uh, to the middle income country by 2030 and uh, addressing these issues. Uh, and after that, it go, goes behind, uh, that is 18th and uh, 19th plan, that is also for 10 year. And th that is basically, that fo will focus uh, basically for sustaining these achievements and uh, and making the society more and more resilient and more, uh, uh, more green. Uh, and, and we know it is. It might be very hard to to consider all the dimensions of green and growth at this moment. But when we take this long term uh, path, it will be easier to to follow that one uh, in the later later period. So so we we make the period for 25 years, and uh, we we try to uh, address the um, targets of the SDGs in the uh, long term vision and. Uh, we we have done lots of mapping and works and uh, exercises of uh, similar Mr. Uh, developing countries that are uh, middle income countries right now or some developed countries that are currently exist and we have done some benchmarking with with these uh, 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 experiences of other countries. So uh, some targets might be very ambitious, but uh, most of them are uh, achievable. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's quite heartening and interesting to, to really see uh, uh, this kind of exercise, which is even much longer than, uh, you know, going beyond 2030. That is how the government should, should, should plan. Uh, Don, if I may ask you one question, I mean, since nobody is asking, I'll take that liberty. Uh, now, you know, we are all aware that 
in coming years, Nepal will graduate from the LDC. And when you graduate from the LDC, uh, they will become a developing country, and many of the uh, you know benefits which are coming to them uh, as an LDC country will be eroded. Like in your presentation, you talked about you know uh, enhancing export capacity. Uh, definitely, uh, export capacity need to be enhanced, but uh, right now, when Nepal is still eligible to get a duty-free quota free market access, uh, when they graduate, uh, that uh, would erode and uh, to some of its major trading partner, except India, because India, they have a bilateral trade agreement, which has nothing to do with the graduation. Uh, in SARC, they have uh, SAFTA. Uh, of course, some direct concessions are happening, but when it comes to Europe, when it comes to US, or when it comes to other developed countries, these duty free, quota free uh, market access provides them um, not only to Nepal, but many of the LDCs uh, uh, a better opportunity or a cutting edge over their competitors uh, who, uh, if you import from there, you need to pay the duty, but when you are importing from Nepal or any other LDC, you don't need to. Now, in the modeling exercise, uh, uh, which also is related to financing, because uh, many a times aid for trade, of course, ODA happens mostly also in the bilateral. Definitely, some financial crunch uh, uh, could come in terms of aid coming from the countries to Nepal. That requires more financing options uh, in various, uh, you know, scenarios. Have, have you, uh, in the model, taken into this account uh, of a graduation scenario or a pre-graduation scenario? Or So thank you. I think that is um, a very important um, question, and I know that you know as the graduation um, approaches, these these uh, the concerns will definitely um, um, become uh, are, are definitely um, uh, uh, an important consideration. Um, so we haven't done that specific set of scenarios applying um, the SCAP macroeconomic model, um, but in the sort of research that uh, we did around developing the model, you know, there were um, a number of issues highlighted, for example, that um, the trade costs um, uh, uh, from the poll are, are already quite high compared to neighboring countries. So there's some scope for uh, reducing those, which I think um, so could certainly offset a large uh, share of any expected um, uh, rise in, um, in duties that could arise. But more importantly, a, a number of the um, research studies have also identified that um, there's high potential for an, eco an economy like Nepal to um, to uh, to increase its higher value added um, exports, um, so the um, export um, uh, structure tends to be focused very much on um, on uh, on sort of lower value added um, goods um, and uh, to a very um, narrow set of countries. Um, but there is, there is one IMF study that um, uh, suggests that there's really, um, uh, it identifies you know, that there's um, a large scope for, um, by increasing sort of quality controls, um, uh, uh, sort of um, regulation on, on um, aligning regulation with um, uh, sort of international standards would allow a, um, a big step up and a big jump um, in the value of goods that could be exported, which would um, deliver higher returns and, and um, uh, fully offset any anticipated um, rise in, in duties that, that could be associated with the graduation. Um, if I could just comment, just um, um, following up on Dr. Acharya's um, comment on uh, the longer term planning, and just also emphasize that, um, you know, having a long term view is, is so important because these, these investment outlays um, that are being made, for example, um, to expand um, hydropower, to uh, invest in transport infrastructure. They're very big upfront investments. 
and the returns would only be um, recouped over over many years. So it really is important to have that full long term view in place in order to to understand the the full benefits of of these outlays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ronan. And I, I see no more flags, so I have uh, done the dual duty of being uh, the the moderator as well as the participant asking questions. Uh, but thank you both for uh, your time, uh, your excellent presentation, uh, as well as the views which you have expressed. Uh, more questions. So what I will do is I will close this session uh, right now here. Uh, but before I do, um, may I request, uh, uh, Pat, are you there? If there is any announcement uh, from my colleague in Bangkok for tomorrow? Um, um, not really, but um, we have posted um, a link to the, the short evaluation form. Um, so grateful if you can uh, feel that um, it would just take uh, just one or two minutes. And also all the presentation slide, including the recording of this even will be posted on the workshop website afterward. Yeah, thank you. And for, for day two tomorrow is meant to be for uh, government official from the, the NPC and staff from the, the RCO, in which we are going to some uh, technical session. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. thank you. Uh, may I reiterate, uh, if you see the chat box, there is a link which has been given for a short evaluation that will also help uh, all of us in improving or taking note of if you find um, uh, or if you have some suggestions to improve and if, if you are happy, that gives a sense of encouragement to all of us and do excel better. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good evening and thank you uh, both the